So, hi Daisy. Hi, yeah. Daisy. Um, when Colette and I sat down to talk, yeah. the first thing I asked her was to kind of remind us of when we first met. Mm. And I was thinking about when we first met, and I thought it was that we randomly met on the train. On the train. Going to London. But it actually wasn't. Wasn't, no. We met at Hamilton College, which mm. was the like pre-meeting for the meeting, I think. The meeting in London was supposed to be, we thought, a patient-led, patient, -led, patient yeah. research project. About, and to research and funding the research. and For um, biologics for lupus and to try and understand yeah. stratification of medicine and... Um, anyway, we were really part of the first meeting, and then when we got to London, <laughs> oh gosh, it was the mo wasn't it like quite fancy to get in, and we thought we were at the wrong building. It was the Royal um, Royal Society of Arts. Yeah, and it felt oh, it was odd, and we oh, you had to go up and down and all around the building to get to the right room, and they had name tags with our names on yes. them, and and we're two people who don't. I mean, I don't know about you, we're not really trek about the country very no. much. <laughs> um, so anyway, there we were, and we had this idea there'd be loads of patients, but it ended up being just you and I who were the only two patients yeah. who weren't like also also part of the project. Yeah. There were two others, but... And then we were asked to talk about our lives with lupus. Just, suddenly. just yeah, out on the table in front of like 15 to 20 people. Who were all doctors and um, representatives of the pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. And they looked really shocked to... Yeah, to hear anything. Like when we said that certain tablets even tasted bad or whatnot, and they were all like, what? It was intimidating, but I felt like we were determined to just oh, make yeah. the most of um, the moment mm. and just ride over their faces and their... It was just power through, ignore anything, yeah. just get what we said we'd do done. <laughs> exactly, represent for Cambridge. Exactly. And then, um, so yeah, and then we've, we've, that was two years ago actually, September 2014. Ago? Yeah, I checked. 2014, so it's three years. Oh god. Time. No. <laughs> oh no. Ah. Brain fog, I thought it was 2016 right now. Sorry, I wrote 2018 on something the other oh, day. I was like, ahead of this game here. So I was diagnosed at 18, but you were even. I was 14, yeah, yeah. so young. Um, yeah, I was. Oh, it was the weirdest thing. So oh, it was a non school uniform day at school, mm. and I'd had like this whole outfit planned out, and I was really excited. I was going to wear these new flip flops I bought, and I went to put them on in the morning, and my feet had swollen up to the size of melons. Like, I had the fattest feet. It was. A very odd thing to overnight. see. It. Yeah, overnight to just wake up at fourteen and be like, "Oh, okay." Mm -hmm. So I got really upset about that, mostly because I couldn't wear this outfit that I planned down to the shoes, mm -hmm. and went to the doctors. And when it hadn't gone away, like after two or three weeks, my GP was really quick, and she just said, oh, "I think it's this," and sent me to Addenbrooke's. And then I was in a. What did she think it was? She thought it was Crohn's. Right. So she really picked it up quickly and said. And said Oh, I think it's Crohn's, and I went to a couple of appointments when they tested, and then they found it wasn't Crohn's. Mm. Three three months, so the fastest diagnosis ever. And it was a systemic lupus, yeah, hematosis diagnosis. Yes, that was okay. Yeah. Um, and they did the kidney biopsy like two weeks later, which went a bit a bit wrong. But. So you got sent to a nephrologist then, yeah, rather than a rheumatologist, yeah. even though they were thinking. Well, I guess because of the swelling, they probably thought nephritis, it's kidneys. It's kidneys yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, but they were so quick. It's mm -hmm. whenever I hear other people talking about how long it took them to get diagnosed, I sort of sit there like, oh, I feel a bit. I yeah, was just but you speedy. see, <laughs> you were speedy, but not in your life. Like in your life, that happened so early on. Yeah. That that's the other side to it. That the earlier we're diagnosed, the longer we live with. Yeah. All of it. That's true. So I don't know who who gets it worse. Does, a yeah, who wins? Yeah, no nobody, nobody wins. But it's the 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 different experiences. I yeah. Think. So they did the uh, kidney biopsy um, two weeks after I was diagnosed, and in that two weeks, I had snuck away on a cheeky holiday to Spain with my family, which probably didn't help. But it was all booked. It they diagnosed me on the Friday, and on the Monday we were booked to go on holiday. So it's yeah. a bit like we're not gonna not go just because yeah. of this thing. Obviously, sunny Spain. Wait, what did you think with the diagnosis? I mean, I went back to school the same day. I was diagnosed at 10 in the morning and went back to school midday. Wow. Because I thought, it's not that big a deal. And you were with your mum and dad? <laughs> yeah, with my mum and dad. And at the time, I remember being 
they said, oh, it's, it's all right, it's very mild, you'll probably be fine, and then... Right. It's like they get a training in saying that word, which is literally the worst word, I think. It's a jinx. <laughs> it's, yeah, because it's not <laughs> no. ever for anyone. And even if it is at that moment, which it probably isn't, because that's mm. why you're in the hospital, but um, it gives you no preparation for the potential of the illness mm. in you in the future. So I think it's it's... Not good training to say that word. No, because I remember thinking, oh, that's all right. That's why I just went back to school. I was like, yeah, okay, cool. It's nothing that bad, and then I'll be fine. <laughs> Same for me. I, I, I was told by the, um, it was actually infectious diseases who diagnosed me, oh, and they said, go away on holiday as well. <laughs> Start your treatment, you know, when you get back. So yeah. anyway, so then you went back to school, and what did your parents think, by the way? Because mine mean... discussed the gas bill. Oh, I think my mum and dad were both like, I was so adamant that I wanted to go back to school because Friday afternoon was the best, I had double textiles, didn't want to miss it. Um, and I think that they were just playing along with how nonchalant I had taken it. Okay. But I do think that when they got home after dropping me at school, they probably had more of a, a chat or a Google about what on earth is lupus. I went in and told all my friends I had lupin because I'd already forgotten what it was. <laughs> And my brain was just on Harry Potter, so... Right, it's Harry Potter was already. Um, so, that's... That's cute. It was... It I do was, I do relate to um, Lupin, just, or anything that starts with L-U-P. Yeah, it's just like, yeah, that, that was what it was. And my friends were like, oh, cool, so what does it mean? I was like, I don't, I didn't really listen in the appointment. I remember it just all going right over my head. Yeah. But at 14, can you really sit there and no. listen to a load of sort of what sounds like mad gobbledygook. Again, I don't think it's age. I literally think anyone sitting there who I receives saw... those Latin words. You're like, huh? Yeah. What? And then you get told it's mild. So really, part yeah. of you switches off. Yeah. You believe that. I remember there's a scale and there's like bad lupus over here and easy to control lupus over here. And I wouldn't worry because you're down here. And I like have remembered that forever because obviously two weeks later I moved up to here and I've yeah. never left. Sort of over here. <laughs> Why do you think they take that upon themselves? I mean, usually you have the sense of doctors trying to cover themselves. Yeah, and but, I, but they just they all do it. They all do. It. Is it because we're female? Are we going to get into? Oh, are we going to get into oh, feminism? Oh, <laughs> it could be, you know. It's a huge part of yeah. it. Ninety percent of lupus patients are women, and mm. most of the consultants we will see are men. Are men. And there's always been this thing about women and when they're unwell being told not to worry as much oh you'll be fine Whatever. It, and it, not taken as seriously yeah so i don't i don't i don't want to think it is my brain doesn't want to think it's like that mm -hmm. but it's you can't oh. <laughs> i think it's it's woven in and yeah. maybe it's changing now of course it's changing now um but i mean how many female consultants do you have The birds are singing. They're just like twittering as you're yeah. thinking. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think that's seen so by some women. Okay. But I, I don't have any active consultants right now, they're women. Yeah. So. I mean, that doesn't mean that if yeah. you have a female consultant, she's going to be the more understanding one. It's mm. just, you know, it's just something. To note and to have yeah. noted the day after the last day of school, we're going to do this kidney biopsy really routine we do hundreds of them a day um just fine you'll be in and out in the same day and it's just a little local anesthetic and it's done and you'll be fine and so i went in with my dad had my little ipod with some i had one of those old ipod video ones that had a couple of films on it from my sister it was totally set up and fine and went in to do it, it was in a little pediatric room and then I got wheeled in to have it done and I remember it feeling wrong, like the procedure itself. Because even with the local anaesthetic, it was agony. It hurt so much. Mm. And I don't fully remember everything because a lot of it came with a blur. But the part of it was basically that the surgeon lacerated my kidney. So... Um, they then, he obviously didn't report it at the time when he'd done it, which is the other issue. So they sent me back to recover and then my blood oxygen got really low and then I was on a ward overnight and I don't remember like in between of it and then it, my mum was away and she came in about 
like in the morning she got there mm -hmm. when I was being carted up to ICU because my I had pneumonia and my lungs were filling up with water and <laughs> the whole thing just went really tits up really quickly <laughs> it went terrible and I remember when they said oh you're gonna have to stay overnight thinking oh I've never stayed in overnight hospital but it'd be fun you remember thinking that I do I remember thinking oh this would be a laugh this would be a right laugh Daisy, like, who are you? I don't what know. <laughs> I thought, oh, it's just something. An someone's, experience. Someone's been melodramatic. There's nothing really wrong with me. I yeah, feel fine. I like... just want to sit here and watch this film. Like, what's going on? And I remember the ward being so loud. Obviously, it's a paediatric overnight ward. There's crying and yeah. noise. Like, I never experienced that. Sometimes Oof. I feel a bit jealous that I didn't get to be on the paediatric ward because I was this funny age where mm. I still needed my parents so much yeah. but because I was considered an adult they didn't want my parents around. Yeah. Which is silly because I remember the day, the actual day I moved from paediatric to an adult sort of situation, it was awful. Like the you're not you're not an adult at sixteen, you're not an adult at eighteen. You mm. there needs to be some kind of in between transition from sixteen when they boot you out of all the nice, colourful, cuddly don't worry, you'll be fine, to the grey walls and yeah. nothing. Mm -hmm. Because it's so stark that yeah. that was horrible. Pneumonia and the whole multiple organ failure thing was in ICU for just over a week. And then they took me downstairs and they'd found out as well that I had antiphospholipid syndrome in this week of all the testing. Okay. So they said, whilst you're down here just on the casual ward for a few more days, we'll start you on warfarin. Mm -hmm. But obviously the tear with my kidney hadn't actually healed, so then I started bleeding internally, went back up to ICU, and like lost my entire summer holidays. <laughs> it was yeah. just so frustrating, because at 14, you're more annoyed that you're missing all your summer holidays than you're actually analysing what's wrong with you. I was just mad. And would that have been the time of... Um... How were you able to keep in touch with friends? It was before Facebook. Yeah. It was I had my mobile phone. So that was still just text and credit. And okay. most, I think I remember not wanting to make a fuss, so I didn't really tell anyone what had happened. So I sort of relied on my older sister and younger sister to, if they saw anyone say at the shops, be like, "Oh, he's not very well." Did but, you, did you want to see anyone? Oh, friends really. wise, yeah. My I remember the first week when it was looking really bad and they weren't sure that they were going to be able to fix it or that I'd make it out. And they had my sisters come in just in case they had to say goodbye and I remember after that I was like, I don't want anyone coming in to see me. I... Then my dad made a joke that I looked like Gollum and it was all just... Dad, that's... It's a dad thing though, he thought so it would cool. cheer me up, you know, it was like a, you don't worry Gollum. <laughs> like, it was like, Great. it's the kind of dad joke that my dad does and I do love him for it because he's always trying to just say the dumbest thing that might just make you it laugh. Might. Yeah. They, um, they can get it terribly wrong but then the one time you smile they think yes success I've done it. <laughs> and from my mild understanding of it is that there was a bit of a rumour that went around that I had died right. which was terrible. <laughs> yeah but I actually remember that happening with someone at our school. Um, Kids talk. Yeah. yeah, and she because she'd been gone a while, that became the rumor. Mm. And but I went back to school, and at this point, over that summer, was when Facebook started to become a thing. Mm. So people started to talk more through Facebook, and and so it became more apparent just as I was about to start school that I obviously hadn't died, <laughs> and that I would be coming back to school. And I remember going in that first day and it was so hard to do a whole day of work mm. at school. I had not clicked at all how massively this big trip into hospital had escalated the loop. I just started my GCSEs, my first GCSE year, and within that first month I dropped three subjects. So it's straight away like, not gonna happen, no way. Really? Then I spent the whole of 2010 jaundiced with liver issues which had cropped up from like a drug poisoning that hadn't worked well with my body. Which drug was that? And mycophenolate. So something that nearly everybody is on. Just Not me, I didn't get on with it at all. No, it just completely messed up everything. Mm -hmm. And so then I started Cyclo which didn't do anything either. And they were trying all these different things and I was just 
muscular like a Simpson and mm. gaining and losing weight like this mm. up and down up and down from like a I was like a 14 and then I was an 8 three mm. months later and then I was a 12 and it was just the most I remember thinking I'm never going to care about dress sizes ever again after yeah. this what about steroids? I'm still on steroids. I've been on them the whole time. So they introduced it quite early on? But when I went into hospitals yeah. when I started. Because that was something. I'd never taken tablets before. Yeah. Why would you um, I took. If I had a headache or I was poorly, we were given effervescent paracetamol. I had never had tablets before. I'd come back out of hospital with, at this point, something like 30 tablets to take a day. And it used to take me 45 minutes. Like I'd just sit there unable to take them and psyching myself up. Yeah, yeah. And did you do that yourself? Or? My mum and dad sat with me whilst yeah. I tried to make myself take these tablets. But when you've never taken tablets, it's the most terrifying thing. You can't make yourself swallow them and they get stuck and you're hacking them all up and you try the sort of liquid versions of some of them, but they're all gross. and Yeah, no one thinks about the taste or the texture or, or what it's like when it comes back up. Or... The, and then that you have to face putting it back in and this goes on every single day. There's there's a note um, in one of my hospital files. Shaisa is hoarding her tablets. So she isn't taking all of them. We've explained how dangerous this is. But it's not like, it's not that I've turned into a tablet hoarder, no. which maybe is a thing or something. Like, it's exactly what you're saying. Yeah. You just, you don't, you know what I mean? It's not a natural thing to suddenly start taking 30 tablets. No. And oh, I don't. It, I think probably the same on mine because it also got to that point where they'd stopped giving me... <laughs> oh, hiccup. Um, <laughs> they'd stopped giving me the enteric coated prednisolone. And the non-enteric coated ones. It's like the most vile, awful thing. So I remember yeah. double ordering so that if next time they tried to give me non-enteric coated I had like another month yeah where I was safe mm. and I remember thinking then oh that's definitely going to be written down that I have double ordered my tablets and it's a safety thing as well I'd rather have a month in advance than yeah. get to the week before and the pharmacy be like well we can't get that for two mm -hmm. weeks so yeah what's considered sensible or self-protecting by us is considered criminal. I know, <laughs> but it's a bit like I'm not taking these for fun, and I'm yeah, not, exactly. Who, do you know anyone that wants to buy prednisolone? I'm not really <laughs> sure we can sell it, so <laughs> it's just a safety blanket. I don't. I hate the thought of because we never know what could go wrong, and with a let's say with a month, which is generally like the max I've ever had yep. in advance. Mm -hmm. You can wean yourself off all the stuff if it suddenly became impossible to get something new, mm. like, or get it again. Mm. Or if there was a situation where, I don't know, when World War broke out and mm. you didn't have tablets. Mm. I know that my fear is I'd have to go and raid the pharmacy first. You know, if people start looting, we've got we to gotta get to the doctors <laughs> first, don't we? Otherwise, that's, that's yeah, what you think about. I think about war too. I think about any situation in which I would literally be the worst burden ever. How exactly how such that, a liability yeah. to people. Yeah, that's how I think how you know, how would we It's all this terrible news and media, yeah, all we're maybe. thinking about is the apocalypse or war and Or even just historically I imagine people in our type of situation and... just straight up died probably. Yeah. <laughs> like no thank you, I'd yeah. rather be a little bit prepared. Yeah. <laughs> even if it's just three weeks more of time. <laughs> <laughs> but know. apparently that's very bad. Very bad. Don't hold your tablets. Don't hold your tablets. Yeah. I managed to end up with six GCSEs at the end, which frustratingly now is no longer the minimum requirement. The minimum requirement for GCSEs now is seven. <laughs> I only have six. But my attendance by the end of my like two year GCSE run was at 26%. Wow. <laughs> it was horrific. I think with um, 2010, when I got the jaundice and the liver failure, and the cyclophosphamide, I just couldn't get to school. So I'd be gone for a month at a time. And my sisters, who were both in school, at the same school at that time, would come home with homework or try to. But so many of the teachers didn't. I remember my English teacher and the head of my house were the only ones who really, really tried to make sure I got mm. stuff at home. But it was madness. Like, what did they expect me to do otherwise? Just rock up for the exams and hope that I pass. <laughs> Um, so there was no, um, the, they had no training either to, no, to deal with a, a child who becomes sick or 
well, a teenager. I, yeah, I think I perhaps was one of the first for the school in, mm-hmm. I guess, recent history that all of the teachers would remember mm-hmm. of it being, I guess, quite so serious. And no doubt you didn't have the language for how to explain what was going on. No. And loops are so hard because I guess after my trip into hospital it was easier to explain the physical, oh she's had this, this and this, but they still, and even now people still don't understand the fatigue side of things, they just think, oh you're a bit tired, do you mm. need to have a nap? Mm-hmm. Like, yes, I do need a nap, shush. <laughs> <laughs> at that time, at, at 15 then, I had to sort of be talking to all these teachers as if I was on the same level as them to explain mm. something that they could have easily googled. Um, and having to act very, very grown up and to learn to prioritise things or that some things you just won't get to do. And it's a horrible thing at that age to mm-hmm. to have to learn to do that. And I remember feeling like an 80 year old stuck in a kid's body and it not working, nothing ever seemingly working out. <laughs> yeah. I'm getting so frustrated. That's what I mean about the word mild. Yeah. Is that there's no preparation for anything and that's not fair because it isn't as though nobody knows what lupus can do Mm -hmm. and the ways in which its ramifications of our lives are going to unfold yeah and and complicated guilt and shame with siblings Mm -hmm. as well yeah um i don't know i can't speak for my brothers but i think it's what what they perceive and how how they're dealing with it is Mm -hmm. is a whole issue because if mental health isn't accorded to us who are suffering the situation directly it's definitely not offered to them no you know no one looks out for the siblings of no definitely a young not. person who's sick uh, i know my brothers were never have never been talked to by any doctor have never been asked how yeah. they are coping or how it's affecting their life and maybe at this stage they'd say we didn't need it but i'm sure earlier on they could have used yeah. it to give them some training how to deal exactly. with that yeah, what about your siblings? Oh, I know that it, for both of them, especially that first three to four weeks in hospital, because of them being asked to come in, I think both of my sisters have always seen me, and not in a bad way, but differently mm-hmm. since then. I think they know that life is different. And for Rosie, my little sister, it was really hard for her in sixth form because when she was in sixth form I was quite sick again. Mm. It's when I was having the plasma and all these infusions. So I just lived at the hospital every week. As a younger sibling, for her to look up to your older sibling, it's it feels like the, the roles have been reversed because I think a lot of times she actually had to look after me. Mm. And I think because of that, my older sister and her had a time when they really didn't get on because I think... For both of them, as well, I worry that a lot of the time, from my parents' view, things had to become about me. Mm. And so my siblings didn't get the attention they deserved at all. I know they didn't. Mm. And I can I can carry that guilt however I will, mm. but I also know that that's counterproductive. It can't be changed. Yeah. But Millie dealt with it differently as well, because before all of this, we used to fight like nothing like mm. everything like hell yeah. <laughs> and and it changes how you value things and obviously we still fight about the most ridiculous things we fought about booking tickets to do something together the other <laughs> week um and it's the most idiotic dumb argument yeah. um but i think we always come out okay because you realize that it's the dumbest thing to argue about like yeah. your values change but i I do solidly believe that both of them end up with therapists and with help, um, which was definitely what they wanted and needed. Really? Mm. Okay. Was that offered? No, I think they both sought it out themselves. But they both went and found Mm. for themselves, like, help and therapy, and and I do believe it worked or helped both of them at different times in their lives. So they were given some tools? Yeah. And uh, obviously my little sister's training to be a paramedic now. Yeah. I'm very proud of her. My older sister is working and for the council and she's 
living this very happy life. She's very happy and I think that's what means the most to me because I hate the thought of having, in a sense, deprived them in any way of a childhood that they wanted because they were both children as well when I got sick yeah. and it just changed the whole family dynamic, yeah. which is a lot to carry on your shoulders at 14 as well. And I know that I shouldn't, but it doesn't just because it shouldn't doesn't mean I won't. <laughs> exactly. It's a reality. Mm. You have had to develop a language for something that no one has been able to teach you. Um, you just had to figure it out. And have you done it entirely by yourself or have you had any have you found anyone or anywhere, any kind of resource that um, has helped or has everything just come from within you? I remember thinking, um, oh that spoon theory video really helped but otherwise a lot of it was just I guess from figuring things out myself and mm. I don't really remember watching a lot of videos or reading a lot of books about lupus I remember for so long just solidly being in that denial mm. so I didn't want to look any of it up I didn't want to to read about anything I just wanted to figure it out as I went so and did you meet anyone? I went to the um, the Lupus UK support group in London for a couple of years. Okay. I haven't been recently at all. Because it's always weekends and that's always you, when you try and book to see people, like let's say your friends who work, because otherwise you can't see them during the week. Mm -hmm. And it's always, always, always on a weekend that I'm busy. Yeah. Um, I guess a lot of the patients at the Cambridge one are of two ages where they're either really young or they're late teens and so maybe when you get to sort of 18 mm. you don't really want to go to support group you think oh I'm grown up now I don't need to go no matter what age you are you want you wish it would just disappear yeah. you wish that you could just stop the story and maybe going to these things and acknowledging it with other people that's quite a huge step in advance I think yeah I mean I wanted to run away the moment I went to my first um, coffee and chat mm. thing I didn't find a single person but then again for me there were no young people there no because I was already you know past the child stage yeah. and so um, yeah so my entire experience of being in hospital is as a young the youngest person yeah but everyone else and it's rheumatology so they were you know, anywhere up to 80 or 90 years old. And yeah. it's one of the most, I think, overwhelming things about lupus is it's just always, you're always the young one. Mm -hmm. uh, or there's always people saying, oh, I had this, this and this, but they're 60 or 70. And it's just not a young people thing. So it, it's really hard to find mutual ground sometimes. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's taken me... 15 years minimum to find people yeah. that um, I can relate to so that means that whole time I've been I don't know like a hobbit you know under the ground oh. just yeah <laughs> <laughs> just so for the first 12 years I was pretty much just living in isolation here and then I started my blog mm. and it's from that point on that the world began to open up yeah. Um, so a, I had to take that first step to engage with the unknown. Yeah. Um, but also I'd had twelve years, and it was I couldn't bear that life anymore. No, um, so that's something that do you think we we have to engage with? Um, it has to be our choice. What do you make of um, Instagram, and what? How did you get? How did you? How do you deal with social media, and what's your? Oof, I feel so overwhelmed by social media. I I think because, not to sound like one of those annoying articles, it's all fake. Mm -hmm. you know, and people only want to post their best days. Mm -hmm. So you only ever see the best of someone's life, supposedly. Mm -hmm. And so you make these pictures or this this idea in your head of what everybody else is doing and how they're living their lives because it looks like every day is amazing because of what they're posting on social media and so you start to look at yourself and you start to think oh well I'm not doing this that and the other and it's a huge comparison issue and 
and I have Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, I've mm. got it all. Yeah. But I go through waves of using it all a lot and then using none of it for nice. weeks at a time because it's also unrelatable. It's yeah. It's people have all these perfect lives on the internet mm. that are definitely not perfect in real life. Mm. And I catch myself doing it as well, I'll be like, well, what I did today, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, because that's the language. You either mm. speak the language and you're part of it, or you step out. Mm. I mean, I mean, or you try to be real. Yeah. And you might hit, like, a nerve and people suddenly all think, oh, wow, this person is so authentic. But that's a risk. Mm. You might very easily not. Yeah. We... Who are thrown into this kind of a life mm. um, where society would really rather not have to deal with us yeah. at all and for some of the time we we play the game which is to isolate ourselves so yeah. we isolate ourselves at home and we isolate ourselves in hospital yeah but then when we want to engage it's it's really hard yeah to make anyone understand the world that we're in yeah even slightly it's, it just seems impossible sometimes to get people just to even understand the smallest part. Mm. Not even the whole thing, right. but just the tiniest little 1%, just to get it for half a day. But they can't. And yeah. uh, it's infuriating and depressing to continuously f have to be telling people that you can't do things and then being like, oh, well, why not? And it's like, you should know by now. <laughs> you should know. Mm. Or to feel left out or or the way that when things do build up you anxiety gets to come and play in and so you just decide that actually not not gonna bother going out because I'm too anxious and it's all far too upsetting because mm. people aren't helping me as they could be mm. and so I'm pushing myself too hard and it's not working for me mm. and so you just lock yourself away and everybody it wins again yeah because they'll just get on carry yeah. on it will get on with itself mm. life will carry on exactly. things will happen people will do all the things that they were going to do and you are left with the with this feeling did i make the wrong decision mm. was it the right decision to rest but then i lost out yeah so you know like when people say do you have any regrets you know they ask people sort of later on in their life and people always say no regrets and i just think well, <laughs> kind of a divine lovely life, life yeah. that you I'm, meet like a minor scatter I'm with... 23 and I yeah. have so many so regrets many. <laughs> yeah 